last couple of lectures, we've talked about various performance aspects like range, endurance, turning, uh, descending, climbing. Today we're going to talk about takeoff and landing. So let's first just think kind of broadly about what is desirable from a takeoff and landing perspective. And uh, for an aircraft, what we care about is what's called the field length, the takeoff field length, the landing field length. That means how much runway do I require to take off? So what is desirable from that perspective? Well, a few things that might come to mind is that uh, one is I want that to be uh, as small as possible, meaning I don't require much distance right, to take off or to land. Uh, that gives me more options in terms of airports that I can go to. If my airplane takes a really long runway, then I'm limited in the airports that I can, I can go to to land at. So as the aircraft designer, I would like to make that number as small as possible. That makes my airplane more appealing because it can be used in a, in a broader set of circumstances. The other thing to think about is that there are those two aspects, right? Takeoff and landing. And I'm really going to be limited by whichever one takes the longest, right? So to put it another way, let's say my airplane uh, could land really quickly. It only takes 3,000 feet to land, but it takes 9,000 feet to take off. Well, I'm limited by that longer length, right? Because if I land, even though I could land maybe in the airport with a short runway, I've got to take off again from that same airport. And if I can't take off from those same short runways, then that's obviously not an option for me. So when we look at those field lengths, it's kind of a, a, the minimum, or sorry, yeah, the, the biggest one, the maximum, is going to be uh, our most limiting factor. So we've got to work out at both of these. So we're going to talk about some considerations. Uh, landing is going to be pretty quick. Uh, that's not usually our, our limiting problem. The main one is going to be takeoff. Usually it's going to take us much longer to take off. So we're going to spend more time discussing takeoff, some of the main considerations. Uh, our end goal here is going to be try to figure out how do we uh, predict how much um, runway we need to take off and understand some of these main trade-offs. All right, just give me a second here to share my screen. There we go. Okay, so first we need to think about uh, what happens with takeoff and landing in these in these large aircraft, and uh, and what we use are what called our high or what are called high lift systems. This equation here we've seen it a few times, but just to help you remember, this is the definition of lift coefficient. We use this a lot. One half rho v squared times reference area. Again, just the definition of lift coefficient. So I'm going to rearrange that equation and solve for v. Okay. That's what's done on the right, and we've done two additional things. We're assuming that uh, we're in equilibrium vertically, so lift equals weight. And the other thing is that I am interested in my stall speed. That's my minimum speed. So to get the minimum speed, I need to figure out when CL is at its maximum. And of course, CL can vary along the range, and that means I get a range of speeds. But my minimum speed occurs at my maximum CL, since that's in the denominator. Okay, so this here then is my definition or is the definition for the 1G stall speed. We say 1G because that means the case where lift equals weight. Okay, so from that equation, uh, we would like, for both takeoff and landing, it's desirable to get that stall speed down. If I can fly slower, that means I could take off sooner. Right? If my stall speed is really high, I need a longer runway to get up to those high speeds before I can take off. Similarly, when landing, if my stall speed is really high, I'm going to be coming pretty fast. I'd like to get that as slow as possible so that when I land, I don't need as much runway. So this is a, a key metric for both takeoff and landing to get that stall speed down. Obviously, weight plays a big role, unsurprisingly. Right, if my airplane is much heavier, it's going to take longer, or sorry, it's going to need to fly at these faster speeds and it's going to take longer to slow down or to get up to speed. Okay, so that's something that uh, I do have some control over, but of course that affects many other things, right? And it's gonna affect uh, my payload capacity and other things. Uh, similarly with reference area, we've talked about this before that to lower stall speed, we're, we want a, a bigger wing. But of course that also comes with trade-offs in, in terms of weight and drag. Density is not something I have much control over, but it is something that is an important consideration. Uh, as the density is, is reduced, that means it's, my stall speed's gonna be higher and that's why 
for example, uh, at higher altitudes, say here locally at the Salt Lake Airport, as compared to San Francisco, we need larger runways, especially if it's a hot day, right? Because at the higher altitudes, higher temperatures, we're gonna have low, lower density, and so that's gonna affect uh, your stall speed, right? That's gonna make that higher. That can actually be important in some airports that are uh, at very extremely high altitudes that may limit the type, that may limit the type of aircraft that can even go there. In fact, sometimes they can able to land and they can't take off. So, uh, but the thing that we have the biggest control over, as we'll see here, is actually the CL Max. It may not seem so at first. We've talked about sort of these fixed air wings, but uh, there's this idea here that for these commercial aircraft. Um, the conditions that we want at cruise are very different from what we want to take off and landing. At cruise, we want kind of this low drag, streamlined shape, but at, at uh, takeoff and landing, we don't care as much about the drag per se. We would love to create lots of lift. So what we really want is some sort of variable geometry where we can have a configuration that has tons of lift. It may have a lot of drag, but that's okay. It's gonna help us take off at these slower speeds where our drag doesn't matter. And we'd like to fold that away, get back to a compact shape at cruise our CL max goes down, but we don't need we don't need to get to such small speeds during cruise, so that doesn't matter. And indeed, that's the the solution that is used uh, in almost all transport aircraft is a is what's called a high lift system it has a variable geometry, but we're limited in what we do. We're not completely changing the geometry; just a few small changes that are going to give us a lot of impact. Okay, uh, there are two main things that are used devices. The first is what's called a flap. Okay, so here's some pictures of various types of flaps. Um, but what we would like to consider, let me draw here this, uh, or I guess I've got already drawn, this curve here. This is a lift curve slope we've seen it a bunch of times. Right? Just my lift coefficient versus angle of attack for this airfoil here. And clean means just the regular airfoil. Uh, the flap is not deployed. Uh, we've seen this a bunch. So the question I want to ask is, what is this curve going to look like when I use a flap, when I deploy a flap? Just think about the physics. What does a flap do to the geometry? And what would that do to my lift curve slope? Think about that for a second. Uh, just to give you a hint, remember that if we had a symmetric airfoil, what did the lift curve slope look like? Something like this, right? This would be symmetric section. I right? remember at zero angle of attack, if it's symmetric, then it has zero lift. And by adding camber, we were able to shift that curve. So this is indeed what happens with a flap. If you look at a picture of this, of this flap, right, what is it doing? It's effectively increasing my camber by deflecting that flap downward. I've taken my airfoil and given it more camber. So as you might expect, I'm gonna shift this lift curve even more to the left. Okay, and it looks something like that, right? So there's the clean, flap extended. I shifted that curve to the, to the left. I gave it um, more camber uh, and that's, uh, that doesn't necessarily increase my maximum lift, but what it does here is that at a given angle of attack, it increases my lift coefficient. So here actually I did get a bigger seal max, that's not always the case, maybe usually it's a little bit more, but the biggest impact is that at a given angle of attack, I can get a higher seal. That's all, that is nice for takeoff, that means I don't need to rotate as much, which is desirable, desirable for passengers, right, that we don't have to rotate as much to get to the angle of attack we want, okay? So that's helpful, but that's not uh, the whole story. Um, just as a side note here, notice these uh, slotted flaps. Um, so instead of just being a hinge here, there's actually a gap. Uh, it has some desirable properties. Uh, if you think about what's happening, what, what happens when I have that slot? What do you think is happening in the boundary layer as compared to a regular airflow or even just a plane flap? Um, so if you're just thinking about that, uh, a regular airfoil, right? Remember what the problem is as I get to high lift. Why are we stalling? It's because that boundary layer is separating. So the boundary layer is working hard, overcoming this adverse pressure gradient over a long distance, right? And eventually, uh, you know, that because of that adverse gradient, we're losing too much energy or momentum and the flow is going to separate. If I have this gap, what happens is that fresh air uh, inflow can be entrained into that gap. So I get some high speed air coming in can re-energize that boundary layer. I've got new momentum here. And so the pressure distribution here uh, can peak again, you know, as it comes up here and like has to recover, right? Uh, here I get kind of some new inflow into this back element. So even though I've got this potentially longer geometry, I get the new inflow coming in. It also actually helps this main 
airfoil is kind of similar to what we talked about uh, a while ago with bikers, right? If we get them behind each other, uh, I increase the effective pressure of the biker in front of me. A similar thing happens is that this airfoil, because this uh, element, this is, uh, this is called the main element, this is the flap here. Because of the flap, the main element doesn't have to come down, this is minus CP as convention, doesn't have to come down to um, as high of a pressure. There's some pressure imposed on it from this airfoil here. Um, so uh, because I, uh, I can go to a lower pressure, this curve isn't as steep. It would otherwise be like this, for example, going down to a lower CP so it doesn't come down as high. Uh, so that means it's also less likely to separate. But the biggest contribution here is that, uh, you know, if that didn't make sense, that you get this re-energized air in the boundary layer. So it's going to have more energy to overcome that adverse gradient. Just a bit of an aside there. All right, so here's a couple pictures. Um, Sometimes you'll see this is a double slotted flap. There are triple slotted flaps. Here's another slotted flap, and this is what it'll look like if you look out your window next time during takeoff. You can see these multiple flaps, and you can see these slots here. Right? And this is going to help the airplane to have a higher lift coefficient for a given angle of attack. So that's part of the answer. That doesn't fully maybe address our problem that we need to get to higher CL. It helps a little bit to get to higher CL. The other technology we're going to use is what's called a slat. Okay, here's a picture of a slat. The slat goes on the leading edge. The flaps were on the trailing edge. The slat here is this element that's uh, in front of the leading edge of the airplane. So take a moment and think about, try to predict, what do you think the curve is going to look like? Clean again, no slats. When I deploy a slat, how is that going to change the character of this curve? So it's not like a flap. It's not really changing my camber appreciably, right? Uh, this is not like the flap where it's this thing on the trailing edge that's bending a lot. This is just this element that gets pushed out here in the leading edge. Um, you could think of it, remember when we talked about airfoils, why does an airfoil have a round leading edge as opposed to a sharp leading edge? Well, we discussed that having that round shape means it's going to be able to go up to higher angles of attack, right? It's more robust. If it was sharp, it would work really well at a certain angle of attack. But as I change that angle of attack, I've got to navigate this big pressure gradient to get around that corner. A slat has a similar effect. It creates this kind of blunting effect. I've got this big shape here. This can allow me to get to higher angles of attack without separating. It also has a similar effect where you can see there's this gap here. So I can re-energize that boundary layer um, while getting a little extra lift around the slat. So what it does, as I said, it extends the angles of attack that I can get to before stall. Um, so we're generally going to use these in tandem, both flaps and slats. So the combination is both going to extend this curve and shift it over. So the combination means I can get to a higher CL and I can get to a higher CL at, without having to increase my angle of attack by too much, which again is desirable for takeoff and landing. Okay, so this is a, a really helpful technology, um, you know, for these large airplanes that uh, we can change our geometry get the type of configuration we want for takeoff and landing, and then fold it back into the wing to a nice compact design, where we don't need that high seal max, and we want a nice clean configuration with low drag for crews. Uh, incidentally, uh, one different, another difference between slats and flaps, we can understand by recalling critical section theory. If you remember critical section theory, this is what we used in one of our homeworks to try to predict uh, where stall occurs and the wing or the airplane CL at where that occurs. Remember, we looked at the airfoil CL max, and here I'm drawing it as a, a distribution, right? And generally, general it is for our homework, we just had a straight line because we had the same airfoil for every section, but in general, it can vary. And we increased the CL of the airplane, move this up until these two curves just touched. And we said that was the maximum CL we could get to because, and then we said that the section that hit it. That's the section on the wing where it's stalled. So here, it'll probably stall outboard. This also highlights the difference between flaps and slats. A flap is going to increase my CL, but the slat increases my CL max. So for a flap, I can put flaps anywhere on the wing. They don't need to extend along the whole wing. But for a slat, I generally need to extend that all the way to the tip. Because if I don't, right, if I have slaps that only go here and give me a high CL max, if I don't extend it out here, then I can't really take advantage of it, right? Because this curve is still going to hit that uh, the lower CL max towards the tip, and I don't want to have that tip stall. So 
I generally the difference there is the, the slats are going to extend along the whole wing, um, not just at the root. As another somewhat of an aside, but uh, an interesting aside potentially, is that this theory here that we've been using seems like it shouldn't work for these uh, swept wings. For your airplanes that are unswept, it kind of makes sense. Uh, but for a swept wing, it doesn't really make sense that it should work. And why is that? This whole idea here is that we're saying this when this curve hits this curve, that's when stall is predicting. What that means is we're taking our airplane and slicing it into these little independent slices, right? What happens here, we're looking at it independent of over here. Basically that those, uh, it's a strip theory that we're thinking of every little strip along the wing as an independent section, a 2D section. That doesn't seem appropriate for a swept wing though, because if I have a swept wing, unlike a, uh, um, a rectangular sort of a unswept wing, I have span-wise flow that occurs, uh, meaning there is flow coming this way. One way to see that, if we go back and look at the pressure distributions, remember an airfoil, it's gonna have a pressure distribution, let's say something like this, this is a minus CP again, where there's gonna be the suction peak, and, and usually actually it's gonna occur much sooner than that, but it's gonna jump to this really low pressure and then it's gotta recover, right? We talked about this early on and on the lower surface, something like this. So that means there may be on this section here, let's say a lower pressure here and then a higher pressure over here, but over here later there's a low and a high. But because I've swept the wing and I've got say this region of low pressure, I get uh, flow over here that's a high pressure is gonna wanna move over here towards those lower pressures, similarly like this. So along the wing, I have this span wise component of flow. And remember that I've got in my boundary layer, first I've got say, air coming in, it's gonna move across that boundary layer. Um, stall is occurring because I have to traverse this long boundary layer. Well, now if I've also got within the boundary layer, right close to the wing where it's moving slow, airflow that's moving this way, a long distance, well, I'm gonna get stall occurring from that spanwise flow. And often, in fact, right, it's gonna initiate around this tip because I've got a lot of flow heading towards the tip which can be bad, one, because we talked about reasons why tip stall is bad, uh, but there's also some other reasons why this can be particularly dangerous for a swept wing. Um, in the early days, in fact, uh, of swept aircraft, this was a common problem where imagine I've got my wing swept back. Now, so we talked about the rolling moment, why that's bad, but imagine now my wing is also swept, not just uh, rectangular, or not just unswept, but it's swept. If I lose lift that's behind my CG, what's gonna happen? So again, imagine I lose lift, same thing as thinking about a downward forced, and my center of gravity is up here. I swept, say, behind my CG. If I lose lift backwards, then I'm going to pitch up more. And if I'm already stalling, right, I'm hitting stall uh, towards my tip, and I pitch back, then my angle of attack increase, so I'm going to be stalling even more. I'm going to be stuck in this deep stall. And that can be quite dangerous. Um, a well-known example of this is the F100 uh, Super Saver. Uh, there was a name for it, I think it was called like the Sabre Dance or something like that. It would get stuck in the steep stall. It was also famous because there's a video taken, qu uh, quite tragic, uh, actually, where uh, I believe it was at Edwards Air Force Base. Um, a Sabre was coming in for landing and uh, there was some filming going on, not for this airplane, but for a completely separate test. Just happened to be there when the airplane was landing and they got stuck. The pilot got stuck in this deep stall. Um, and uh, you know, I had a catastrophic crash. It rolled over, landed, exploded. A pilot died. Uh, very tragic uh, circumstance, uh, in part caused because of this phenomenon. Okay, so uh, there was a solution. You know, one thing that people had done was to say, let's create a fence. A fence is just kind of like it sounds. Let me draw a better sweep. This like has almost no sweep. Okay, so here's some sweep. Uh, and they would build a fence so you could put like, let's say a little metal bracket or something, right? You put some of these here. You might have seen some of these before. And so that would stop the flow. So maybe their flow is coming this way and it would hit that and it would then be forced to go streamwise. So we wouldn't get all this flow going towards the tip where the boundary there was getting really long and was prone to separate. Um, but that's not, so that, that uh, solves that problem. But then it creates another problem if you remember back to simple sweep theory, the whole idea is that we actually wanted the flow to go normal to these sweep lines, right? We've thought about it how, uh, 
the important velocity component was that it was perpendicular to sweep, that uh, that was the component that mattered for compressible flow. And if we change the behavior with these fences, actually ruins how these aircraft perform at high speeds. Um, so these fences are not, are not particularly desirable for that. Uh, they can affect some of that behavior. Uh, it may help us at these lower speeds um, or for some of the stall behavior, but then it hurts some of the higher speeds. So uh, a solution that was stumbled upon somewhat accidentally um, at Douglas Aircraft, I believe this was with the DC-8, they were doing some wind tunnel tests and they had the DC-8 and um, they had a new wing I think the engines were on the tail and it was performing really poorly to get the high lift coefficients they wanted for the reasons that we've talked about here because of the uh, span wise flow and the early stall that's occurring. Um, so uh, they, what happened is they found that the old airplane, the DC-7, uh, and I can't remember if the engines were on or not, I think maybe just the pylons were on this model, but they put it on by chance and found that all of a sudden it worked really well, the lift coefficients were really great again. And the difference they discovered between the two wings was just that there was these pylons, right? So the pylon is, uh, you know, under the wing, if you've got a wing mounted engine, it's gonna be a horrible picture, but say here's my engine, right? And I've got this little pylon, this thing that it's mounted onto, okay? And the engines, you know, even if they remove the engines here, right? So you've got just this little pylon thing. They found that uh, just that it was enough to um, make it so that the airplane still had this nice high lift uh, behavior. And so they kept whittling down the pylon and found they could make it really small. So you could have um, just a small little thing under here, um, that's not to scale, but just this little thing uh, that worked really well. And why was it? So they figured out that what would happen is that at low angles of attack, you've got this little nub here and it came to be called a vortilon. Uh, for vortex generating pylon, that at low angles of attack, it didn't do much, right? A lot of the lift, most of it is carried on the upper surface. There wasn't as much penalty here on the lower surface. But as you went to a higher angle of attack, oh boy, let me re retry that. As I get to, and I'm just drawing a little extreme here just to illustrate. I've got this little thing here. Because at this higher angle of attack, what would happen is that you get flow separation occurring here uh, off of this little bump and it would create this vortex that would come over uh, the airfoil. And if you've, uh, let's say this is occurring here and I've got this little vortilon here and it creates this little vortex, then it creates an aerodynamic fence, not a physical fence, but an aerodynamic fence because you've got this vortex going along. And so the flow is the same thing where it's forced to go stream, uh, forced to go back along the streamwise direction. Um, so, it had the best of both worlds, meaning that at high speeds, when we're at low angles of attack, it didn't do much, didn't ruin our high speed properties, right, because it didn't affect the flow. But as we went to these high angle of attacks at low speeds, right, low speed corresponds to angle of attack, so we're at high CL, then that Vortilon would create a vortex and create this aerodynamic fence. So this cam comes for free, so a lot of airplanes don't need this if they've got um, wing mounted engines. Uh, but if you didn't, if you had them in other places like on the tail or the fuselage or things, then uh, many aircraft will have this thing called a Vortilon, vortex generating pylon, uh, to give you this nice behavior. Again, sorry, somewhat of an aside, but uh, interesting history there. Okay, so let's get into the meat of it here. Let's figure out takeoff field length. Um, so the thing that uh, uh, is going to govern field, takeoff field length uh, as specified by the FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulations, uh, is that we need to start from zero, we're going to a ground roll, we're going to speed up, and takeoff field length is uh, measured by the point, not just on the ground, but we need to be able to clear some obstacle of height H, and I think the FAR specify that as 30 feet. Uh, but you can look at that. Not too important for our, our uh, discussion here, but basically just saying that it's not just the ground part, but we also need to clear some obstacle. All right, then the whole key with takeoff field length is that we've got this point where we need to make a decision. And the speed at which we're gonna make that, we call this the decision speed. The decision is, uh, and the whole part of takeoff is that I may have an engine out. That's the critical uh, uh, criteria 
that's going to affect my field length is what happens if there's an engine out. If all my engines are working and I just take off normally, that's fine. That's not the problem. That's not my limiting factor. My limiting factor is uh, that all my engines might not be operating and one may go out. If an engine goes out, I have to decide, do I stop, right? Do I put up, hit the brakes and stop? Or am I going too fast? I don't have enough runway left that I still got to take off. So my airplane needs to be designed that I can do that, right? That I can take off on one engine. But what I need to figure out is how much runway do I need to balance those decisions? So if you think about it this way, imagine that uh, my engine goes out very early on, or in other words, at a low speed. If I'm at a low speed and my engine goes out, I'm gonna stop, right? But if I'm going at a high speed and my engine goes out, then it's gonna take me too much runway to stop. It's actually gonna take less runway to take off, right? So I'm gonna just keep, I'm just gonna continue off. And I want to balance those, right? I wanna find a field length that doesn't bias towards one or the other. Okay, and this point, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail here, this point, this decision speed that kind of balances those uh, is called V1 in the regulations. And uh, it's generally gonna be announced to the pilot when that occurs so that, um, and, and you know, he or she should take their hands off the throttle even so that you don't mistakenly um, try to stop because so so what this decision mean speed means is that if an engine out occurred before that speed you should stop if it occurs after that speed you need to take off okay let's try to break this down here is a plot of distance that I'm going to travel as a function of when that decision oh or sorry as a function of that decision speed meaning I don't know what that decision speed is yet I'm going to try and figure that out but let's just say uh, these are different candidates for what that decision speed could be. It could be very small, it could be a very high speed. And what I'm going to plot here in this dashed line here is how far do I need to go to reach that speed. So obviously if I need to get to a higher speed, it's going to take me more distance to reach that higher speed. And this is just a linear thing, right? That, um, the, the higher the speed that I need to reach, the further the distance is going to take me to get there. Okay, so this is just a reference point that it's going to take me for a given speed at least this far, or it's going to take me this far to reach that speed. Now I'm going to draw two curves. I'm going to have you try to predict what these curves should look like. So just draw something like this and see if you can predict what the behavior is going to look like. The first one is going to be this. Imagine that my decision is always going to be to stop no matter what. Okay, so let's say at this speed, you, re you get to, it takes you this far to reach that speed. And then at that point, I say stop. So where would you draw a point to say, how long is it gonna take you to stop? Okay, and now there's gonna be a whole bunch of points. It's gonna make a curve. You're gonna draw a curve that starts from zero all the way up to this speed. What does that curve look like? Does it, is it a straight line? Does it increase? Where does it go? So just take a second, pause and draw that. Okay, this is what it looks like. Uh, and there are two key things that you should probably, uh, that you may have been able to guess. One, of course, is that it needs to be above this line, right? This is the speed or the distance it takes me just to reach that speed. And it's gonna take me some more distance to stop. Now that I've reached that speed and I say stop, well, it's gonna take me some distance to stop. Of course, at zero, it doesn't take me any distance. The other thing that you, know, you may or may not have guessed, but that you can see by this line, is that at a higher speed, it's gonna take me more distance to stop than it does at a lower speed. So this isn't linear. As I'm going faster, generally, um, you know, that's going to increase my stopping distance even more. Okay. Um, and I know that these plots, they take a little bit to digest when you first see them. This is maybe not an intuitive way to look at it necessarily, uh, but this is, uh, well, as we'll see in a second, this is going to be the clearest way, I think, to, to understand these trade-offs even though we're not used to looking at these diagrams. So again, to try to recap, imagine uh, this is my decision speed, just some arbitrary point. And I say, okay, how long does it take me to reach that speed? Now at that speed, I get an engine out. How long is it gonna take me to stop? It's that far. And then I just repeat that process at all sorts of different speeds to see what would happen if this was the speed I decided that I'm gonna stop at. Um, that's my decision speed. Okay, so now we need to draw the other curve. This is gonna be, our, this one was accelerate stop, this other one's gonna be accelerate climb. So this curve is gonna be, um, at this speed, we are gonna say, okay, so an engine went, went out and we're just gonna climb, no matter what, just go ahead and climb, okay? 
Now see if you can draw what that curve is going to look like. Just take a minute and do that. Okay, this is what it's going to look like. Um, and of course, again, it's going to be higher than this curve. The other thing that you should get is that it's going to decrease. So why is that? Well, imagine I'm at these very small speeds and then at this point, I've hit V1 and I say, okay, climb, right? We're gonna simulate an engine out here. You need to climb no matter what. Well, because I'm at a very low speed, it's gonna take me a while, a long time to get up to the speed I need to, to take off and climb. Whereas if I'm already at this really high speed, uh, then it's not gonna take me as long to take off. The reason why this drops is because if an engine went out at this point, then I've got to climb or I've got to accelerate uh, with only one engine or let's say at least one less engine, depending on how many engines I have. But typically it's gonna be a twin. If I've only got one engine, it's gonna take me a long time to get up to the speed that I need to before I can climb. Whereas if my engine went out way up here, this was my decision speed, and I had two engines this whole time, then I'm almost to the speed I need to take off anyway. So having that one engine uh, isn't gonna be as long. So I don't need as much distance to get up to the speed I need to, to climb, okay? So that's why this curve drops. All right, so the decision we need to make then is what is my decision speed? Where should I choose, uh, or what, what is my field length from this plot? All right, so one way we can think about it, imagine that my decision speed was right here. That would mean that um, it's gonna take me, uh, well, let's say it this way, at this point, remember V1 is the point where if an engine goes out, um, we are going to uh, stop if we're below that speed and we are going to climb if we are above that speed. Well, we'll continue to accelerate and then climb if we're above that speed. So if this is V1, it means that it's gonna take me more distance to stop than it does to climb. That means we didn't optimally balance these things. In other words, my field length is this, not this. It's gonna be this distance because I gotta take the maximum, right? Because if I'm just, let's say, a hair below V1, then I'm gonna stop because that's what it means for that to be my decision speed. So I'm gonna use this curve. If I'm just a teeny bit past V1, I would use this curve, but that means you know, that I'm gonna to have to take the, 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 in the worst case, this is gonna be the field length I need because it may be in the worst case that I get an engine out just right before V1 so I'm limited on this side. Conversely, if I picked a speed over here, I'm gonna be limited by this maximum because just to the right of it, I'm gonna to have to climb and so I'm gonna require a bigger distance. So what I want to do, my field length, is this point right here. That's the decision speed, right? So if I took the maximum of these two curves, it looks like this and it looks like that. So for any choice of V1, it's gonna be worse unless I pick this case right here. That exactly balances my two considerations so that any speed below this, I'm gonna stop. Any speed above this, I'm gonna climb. So I'm gonna pick these things that take less distance. So in other words, as I increase in speed, if an engine goes out, I'm gonna follow this and stop. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop. And if I'm past this point, then I'm going to climb. So I'm always taking these minimums. And so the worst case is if I have an engine out right at this point, right at V1, you know, or say just a hair below or hair after, that's the worst case. So this is the field length that I need. That's how much runway I'm gonna require where I balance those requirements, okay? Uh, again, usually this takes a couple times of looking at it to kind of digest that. So, you know, if, if that didn't quite make sense, maybe review it again and ask a question in class and let's try to help clear that up. Okay, so that's a takeoff. Landing, like, so we're not gonna go into as much detail, but just the main consideration. Um, as far as we've got three segments here. Um, the first is, again, it's, it's not just the runway, we've got to think about an obstacle. So as we get to some height h, we're gonna have a glide segment. Remember from last time, what does my gliding segment depend on? Depends only on my lift to drag ratio, all right? So this is a function of lift to drag. Then as I get towards the runway, I'm gonna be decelerating. I haven't hit the ground yet though. I'm just slowing down, getting towards my stall speed. And then I get to the ground and this is my rolling distance here on the ground. Those are the three segments. Um, so L over D matters here. This of course, this runway part, and, and you know, I could change uh, you know, where I start to this end, but here, this is really governed by stall speed. And in fact, landing field length, I mean, as far as engineering parameters, that's gonna be the biggest thing is my stall speed, kind of like we talked about at the beginning. 
but practically speaking, this is really a strong function of, of pilot skill, um, that the pilot can get to the ground quickly and um, deploy spoilers and brakes quickly, as we'll see, although the brakes will generally be automatic, uh, and spoilers too, potentially. But it's really about pilot skill, about getting to the ground. Um, OK, so uh, one technology that is used, we talked about flaps and slats. Another one that you'll see if you look out the window are what are called spoilers. Uh, this is some pictures of spoilers. Uh, and I'll have you just think about for a second, what do you think is the purpose of a spoiler? Um, there are two, but there's really one that's most important. Uh, so one, you can see it's going to increase my drag, but that's not the most important function. The most important function is that it drops my lift uh, significantly, right? So, I mean, you know, we've talked about stalling the airplane, basically just cause the flow to completely separate at that point, so we lose a lot of lift. The reason why that's important is that, uh, let's think about the drag force, the, the X component of the force acting on the airplane. So the force is going to be the drag. There is drag acting. Um, but there's also going to be the friction force. And if you remember back to physics, right, it's the coefficient of friction times the normal. So I've got my friction coefficient times the normal. And the normal is going to be my weight minus my lift, right? So if my lift was equal to my weight, that means I'd be just hovering. I mean, not really hovering, but I'd be just above the ground, right? Or just, even if I was touching the ground, I'd have no weight on the ground. Um, and ideally, I want that lift to be zero. Right, so that I've got my full weight on the ground, that means I've got my full surface no normal, the most friction possible. So this drag is important, but that's not as effective in stopping me as friction is. I want to get this lift to zero so that this is a big term. I've got that full friction force and my brakes can be most effective because that's going to slow me down much faster than just the drag. Not to say that is important, but this is a much bigger term. So that's the purpose of these spoilers deploy it. Sometimes you'll even feel a more sudden drop if you're not, if you just barely, you know, you bounce a little bit. Um, you want to get that lift gone, right? So you can get your full weight on the ground and, and, and slow down from, fr from friction. Okay, so that's, that's what that's for. But, so like we talked about landing though, usually we can land much quicker than we can take off. Uh, but in both stall speed, um, stall speed was a key engineering parameter, we want to get that down. And for landing or takeoff, it was really this kind of key balance between um, this decision between should I stop or should I continue? And I, we want to get that the landing field length is basically right where it would be worse if we picked any speed just to the left or right of that. It's the speed that balances that. That's our minimum that we can have. That's our field length that we're going to be um, uh, that we can land or that we can take off and land at. I mean, really take off, but usually that's limiting for both. So. That's going to be a key engineering design parameter um, for the engineers working on that portion to be able to get that landing or takeoff field length down. Okay, so next time we're going to start talking about structural aspects of the airplane. This will end our, our topics related to performance.